Buenas noches. Eh, gracias por estar con nosotros esta noche. Mi nombre es Edwin Meléndez. Soy el director del Centro de Estudios Puerto Riqueño. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you tonight. Uh, it seems that the rain is delaying a few people, but uh, we're going to have a great conversation. And uh, we're also live streaming, so the next time uh, you, you get in traffic, you can always hook up to the internet and, and get us too. In any case, it's uh, my great pleasure to attend this uh, center events. We have quite a few this semester. We came out of a 40th anniversary celebration that lasted one year. Well, a bit more than one year. Just last Friday, we celebrated our last affinity event in Boston. We went all around the country. So it's been quite a hectic time for us and a great celebration of our 40th anniversary. So I invite you to go to our website and get a hold of the director of the Central Archives, a, a, a guide to the research uh, that Central has conducted over four years and so on and so forth. You have some of the new books, titles in, in, in the front, and I encourage you to get to know Centro a bit more. As you know, Centro is a research center primarily. Uh, from that uh, vision evolved into uh, a library, creating a library and archives, and now we have uh, a full-blown outreach and event uh, program, and this is part of that. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. We have a distinguished panel, and I'm not going to say all about them. I'm going to transfer uh, the leadership in a second uh, of the panel. But let me just say that we have uh, Sean Noriega, who's a professor of film and television, and director of the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA, a colleague of mine at IUPLR, co-director of IUPLR. Um, we also have Pepo Soy, who is a professor in his own rights and the subject of the book uh, and that we're going to be discussing tonight. And uh, lastly, but uh, um, surely, uh, the person who's going to help me out here is uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, who's a professor uh, of history of art and visual culture at UC uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, she also teaches in New York. Uh, I forget where, but uh, it teaches in the program for independent studies. And the Whitney Museum. Okay, and you're going to say a few more words about them and about yourself. So welcome uh, the panelists, please. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm Jennifer Gonzalez. And I'm just going to start us off with um, a little memory. When I first met Pepon, I was a student in the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program in 1994. And he was kind enough to meet with a young uh, scholar who he didn't know, who was interested in his work. And he gave me this wonderful tour of the Lower East Side. And we talk about the casitas and looked around at some sort of homemade architecture and thought about city space and urban life and who gets to have access to housing and who doesn't. And we had this really enlightening conversation. And those of you who know Pepon, and as I imagine a number of you do, it was a transformative experience for me. It was really uplifting. It shifted the focus of my work somewhat. And Pepon's work became a central component of my first book, uh, which was called Subject to Display, Reframing Race in Contemporary Installation Art from MIT Press. And then Chon Noriega, uh, who I also met a long time ago when we were grad students, uh, said, you know, Jennifer, we have this Aver series with University of Minnesota Press. How about if you do the Pepon Osorio book? And I said, I would love to do that, because I get to write about more pieces that I didn't get to write about in my other book. And um, one of the best parts of the project for me was being able to interview Pepon and talk to him about his life history and get to more in depth and get a greater sense of his practice and his early years as an artist working, as an activist, as a member of a community. And so what I thought I, we, we could do tonight is we're going to look at some images directly from the book. And we're going to sort of use those as touchstones for a conversation among the three of us. I'm not going to talk very long about writing or the process. I'm happy to answer questions about that. But we really thought it'd be great for us to talk about the work and what it's like to do the kind of work Pepon does. And what are the challenges? What are the inspirational moments? And so Chon and I have known his work for many years. So we'll just kind of treat it as a conversation. So if we could go to the first slide uh, in the book. Uh, en la Bavaria no se llora, No Crying Aloud in the Barbershop, was uh, a piece that was actually up right around the time when I met Pepon. And uh, it inspired me to ask him a bit about his working practice. Because this is a very important piece uh, located in a community that had seen a lot of violence. 
uh, and in uh, Hartford. Hartford, Connecticut, particularly. Um, on this particular street, there had been a number of youths who had been killed within a year. And Pepon thought, well, how do I make contact with this community? How do I um, address the question of masculinity and violence? And how, did I, how do I think about that as an artist? And so I'd like to ask you, Pepon, when you first got there and you were looking around and meeting people in the community, what made you think about doing an art installation as a barber shop? Because this was a real interesting radical break for uh, an artist, in any case, to do this kind of show first in a public space and then to, um, to pick a barber shop. Can you say a few words about mm -hmm. this piece? Sure. I, I just wanted to say thank you to um, yes. Evelyn and um, Chong and uh, yeah. Jennifer for being here. I'm sure they feel the same way. We're happy. This is like a wonderful opportunity. And um, so lucky to see so many familiar faces. Thank you. Um, what preceded this installation, and I think that I had to go back so then it can make sense as I move forward. What preceded this installation, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I just want to see your faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, was um, uh, a circumstance, a, a tiny detailed thing that happened in the process of it, which was that um, the piece that came before this, called The Scene of a Crime, was in, um, in the New York Times. And it was at uh, one major exhibition in, in, in New York City. And, I, um, and it was half a page, which was a, a very big deal um, for me. And so I took the, I took the uh, New York Times and I brought it to um, um, a group of people that collaborated with me in the scene of a crime. And I said, look, look this picture in the New York Times. And um, I would never forget that the woman looked at me and said, Pepon, what is the New York Times? <laughs> and then I just immediately made the connection that these things were not working, that the people that I was collaborating with and the attention that the installations were getting were somehow dislocated. And I decided that this is the very first piece that I decided from then on that every time a commission was uh, uh, offered to me, um, I will present the work in the context of the community first, and then it will go to the museum. And it was basically for that very same reason. Um, I, um, so what moved me was uh, to do this installation was the very same uh, uh, reasons that you were talking about. And I kept seeing a lot of conflict, and I remember there was an, um, um, a senior citizen uh, center right in front um, of yeah, right across from the street of where the installation was, which happened to be an old beauty parlor. And, um, and I saw the kids in the front somehow um, talking to each other, but at the same time a sense of lost. And then I just started to gather the guys, the men, the older men from the senior citizen, and the young kids to talk, and that, that's how it all started. And then I realized that um, our identity, and, and somehow as much as I want my work to be about others, it's really about myself. And I don't, I don't have a big ego, but, <laughs> but I tell you that at the end, the full circle, it just when, when you realize and you're in the middle of the mess, you realize that this is about me. This is really about me. The whole issue was about confronting, um, I usually use um, the two or three theories um, based on, on, on real life, and it was about race and being um, um, a, a, a Puerto Rican of African descent, that's all of us, but anyway, <laughs> coming from that place, <laughs> and, um, and at the same time um, remembering, during the process of my work, always, I've, I've always had these childhood memories that come into play, and, and, and somehow they position themselves in the center of the production. And I remember my father taking me to, um, to a barber shop, and he wanted to um, give me a haircut. I mean, um, take me for a haircut, and it was, he was very proud. And I was supposed to be making him very, very proud. And um, the guy didn't know anything about curly hair, and he did a terrible job. And I cried my eyeballs out. That's all I remember. And my father was somehow disappointed and couldn't understand the many levels what was going on, but I was really crying and very upset about the whole situation. I just finally told um, my father, I was five years old, and I told my father, you know, he doesn't know how to cut my hair. And, um, and it surprised him. 
But at the same time, this is what is called no crying aloud in the barbershop. It's this imposition of machismo, it's this imposition of this ritual that we men go through um, without looking at ourselves three-dimensional. Actually, just looking at ourselves flat. And also the invisibility of some of the prominent um, Puerto Rican men in that community who are not um, noticed. And so, as you go in, well, you can see them on the right hand, on the left hand side as you come in, all those um, pictures of men. So the work is a magnet, actually, it, but at the same time, it's a, it's a, a sort of a translation of that very same moment that everybody relates to in the community. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Can we go to the next image? Oh, and, and by the way, I have a video of the opening <laughs> of, uh, of the barbershop. Nobody. Why don't we go ahead and go back to the video of the opening? Yeah. yeah. And it's the second one. There you go. And so what I, what I wanted to do at that opening for the first time was to bring together the people who are um, museum curators with the people who were the local and the residents and the people who controlled that neighborhood and that area, and both politically and socially. And um, we, I began to um, think about how do I, how do I, how do I create a space where, in an opening where people become curious and they come in. And the idea was that um, since it was going to a um, a museum afterwards, the idea was to reverse the role of presenting the work and asking the people from the museum, museum goers and staff, to then come to the um, neighborhood as a way to answer in the question of why do people don't come here? <laughs> and so then that was the difficulty and then actually the conversation that happened back and forth. My work is extremely complicated and my process is complicated because I live a very complicated life. But um, what you saw at the very beginning, and I hope you did, was uh, we gave a, a free haircut. And people in the community were lined up, and also curators were lined up <laughs> to get a free haircut. But I also broke three huge baron dandy, is that what you, the, the, the cologne, men's cologne, oh, yeah. in the front. And everything smelled oh, like, men's cologne. like, right. like oh. really challenging men. <laughs> Presence. And it was about creating a presence there that spoke of class and also um, masculinity. The conversation in the community is one of uh, affirmation, mm -hmm. and it's one of um, relating to it. I, they, as I said, the process is extremely complex because I looked and I buy within a one mile radius of that of that of that uh, place, and I hired. In terms of the uh, employment, and hire the people to work with me who work in that community. So it's a little bit more complex than that. At the end, the discussion about the place of contemporary art within the context of tradition is the one that always stands out. Like, where does this work fit in the tradition? In my tradition, mm -hmm. people are interested in very much um, um, engage with the with the objects. Um, in the museum uh, becomes or the gallery space. Um, exhibition space, let me put it that way, becomes um, a little bit more of a clinical um, situation where the work is actually seen and um, the work is seen but there is a certain degree of separation from it where you have to behave in a certain way, where people need to um, react to it in a certain way and somehow it's framed within some sort of like a middle class mentality that often offer that opportunity of where I am and how I am in relationship to the work. Now, the scene of the crime, because th this is a really uh, pivotal shift in your work, but also I think an installation and the debates taking place about artists going out into a community uh, and then ultimately situating the work in a gallery space. In scene of the crime, you kind of play with that in terms of the police tape blocking out a place you can't go into anyway because of uh, museum protocols. Mm -hmm. That's right. In yeah. fact, actually, I wanted to come back to this image because you wrote about this one in the book. One. <laughs> so, so what Papon did, which is a really oh, okay. innovative first time that I know of an artist doing, it was he actually invited real detectives. He had met some detectives through working as a social worker for children um, in the Child Victims Unit. And he had met some actual detectives in that process. And he said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to come down to the Whitney Museum, and I want you to investigate my installation. 
I want you to come in and treat it like a crime scene. I want you to dust for fingerprints. I want you to put up police tape. And they did. Mm -hmm. And so it was really the first time ever that someone had a uh, real detectives come and investigate an artwork rather than a museum where an artwork had been stolen, for example. So can you say a little bit about your, your decision to do these kind of unorthodox um, crossing between communities and how that figured in this piece and any of the other pieces? Well, it, it's, I think it's a very um, um, intuitive kind of a, a, a thing. It's about, it's, it's really finding ways of feeling comfortable in a place. And, um, and the idea was that I, I always make associations between, I've always think that the register in a museum, it's like my grandmother. And, and this might sound crazy, <laughs> but it's true. You go to my, my grandmother had every single document of what happened in the history of our family. My umbilical cord was somewhere <laughs> hidden, somewhere back there. My, um, my, uh, my mother's you know, wedding, this and that, were on the china cabinet, you know? And I always associate uh, registers in that, in that, in that, in that way, uh, registers. I always associate curators with all the different roles. So what I wanted to do was then at that point, because I felt that I was so removed from that reality, which I still are, um, removed from that reality, um, I wanted to bring the people that I felt that had contributed to the work and that also wanted to bring people that um, the, the, some, some kind of leverage in terms of communication and understanding of the work. So when, when this happened, that the guys were, um, were there, I, actually it was the same day of the um, World Trade Center, the first bombing on the World Trade Center, very same uh, day, they came over and then it was uh, the director, that David Ross, the director of the museum in, on, my, on my right, the, um, the curator for the exhibition. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Sussman, and I think that Lisa Phillips was somewhere in there, and in the register, and the two detectives. And then they're coming in, and I'm looking around, I'm going like, yeah, this looks like the reality that I live. Um, and, and so they come in, they walk in, and the register starts acting up and saying, no, you can't get into this, like, leave him alone, he knows what he's doing. And for me, it's about creating a leverage between these two, these two practices. Mm -hmm. You know, creating a place where I can feel not only comfortable, but I also bring knowledge from a place and, um, that is not necessarily reflected in the museum. And these guys were really, really knowledgeable. Of course, they asked me all the time, you know. And then that's the other thing, as, a, as, a, as an artist, going in there and trying to convince them that I'm an artist and trying to convince them that I'm not using this knowledge that they're passing on to me to make a crime that is really an art installation. Because uh, I was just like, if you, if you, pick, if you use the nice pick and hit someone, and I was like, how does the blood flow? And the guys were like, <laughs> uh, what's going on? And I'm like, no, no, really, really, it's for an installation. What's an installation? Then I just get into all these things, and by the end, we actually, we know each other pretty well, and then, you know, that's what happens. I just open spaces for, an open path for people that have knowledge to go into those places that I feel are somehow rigid. Right. And yeah. Unfamiliar from both sides. Yes. It's unfamiliar from yes. both sides. John, did you want to go back and talk about a couple of those pieces we passed, or should we move? Well, I have a little bit more about this. It's, it's a fascinating piece because it was in the Whitney uh, Biennial in 1993. This was known as the Identity Biennial, and it was largely dismissed uh, precisely for a fairly large inclusion of uh, women and minority uh, artists. Mm -hmm. And I think you and Daniel Martinez in some ways became the poster children uh, uh, as the bad poster children uh, for a certain type of work. And yet I think what's fascinating for me is, is having seen that a number of times during the, during the exhibition, it's a very thoughtful argument about cultural imaginings. Mm -hmm. um, do you take this as an ethnographic display of an actual Puerto Rican house or as a combination of the actual with the imagined, and then outside of the installation on, on one of the walls is just a row of what they used to have back at this time, 20 years ago, videotapes, <laughs> of all the Hollywood films that stereotyped uh, Latinos as... Particularly Latino men. With comments of people. Yeah. Because it was, yeah. So right, Pepon had interviewed men and said, 
you know, what do you, how do you, what do you think about these films? Yeah. And they would say, well, we're always sh shown on these films as yeah. aggressive and violent, or you know, we're always depicted as criminals. And these quotes were also t on the videotapes. Yeah. And, and that part never really worked its way into the critique. Uh, people stuck with this scene right here, not the fact that it was actually a fairly thought out um, uh, and complicated uh, installation. They, in some ways, took the one part and that imagination as the totality of it and stayed within it. Yeah. So. I was just going to say, and they would literalize it because one of the other things Pepon was doing, and you should talk about it, not me, but there's a lot of really complex iconography in the, in the piece. Mm -hmm. If you look in the back, you can see some statues, sort of statuettes that look um, like Christian saints. And they're, they're sort of playing a double role. They're sort of playing a role as these Christian saints, St. George, Santa Barbara, but they're also playing uh, roles as orishas within the Santeria tradition. And a lot of the critics completely missed what was going on in the piece. They weren't looking at the color scheme and the choices of color that had to do with Oshun or Ogun, these other um, Santeria figures. And actually, Pepon had occupied the space with many very carefully selected iconographic elements and images, including photographs from people all over his community that were hung all over the walls. It was a very phantasmatic space. It was not really a realist representation even though it looked like a kind of interior diorama kind of space. Right. And the, the, the mainstream art critics just tended to look past that and say, you know, oh, it's a Puerto Rican household and, you know, it's full of, full of knickknacks, you know, and chucherias. But they didn't actually go farther to do another reading on that. Did you right. want to say Yeah, no, that the linoleum um, floor ex extended um, into the gallery because uh, I wanted people to stand on linoleum. And, and look at the work from a, play, from, a, from a position. But I have to tell you that the story is told, I don't know if this is the only slide that uh, you have. You know, we might have some others. Can you? Um, this, and this, is, this is a, a, a really interesting connection here, because the story is told by Pura Belpere. And, and if you look at the right, if, if I was to show you the right-hand side of the story, the picture which I got from El Centro, which are a great resource for me, <laughs> was um, um, an image of Pura Belpre on a chair telling the story. That's the first thing that hits you on the face. So when you, when, when, if you know, and if you, if you know about Pura Belpre and the storytelling and who she is, and, and you know what this story is all about. And then you begin to understand that it's not only one person telling the story, it's actually a community telling the story. And so um, that was also uh, missed. I wanted to show you this is, you would never be able to. No, but this is, this is, this is the lady that I gave the New York Times to. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. The one who said I there, Yeah, New what New York Times? That's, that's her. It was a very difficult and complex piece, but I wanted, what I really wanted it to do was push people over the edge. Right. Um, with this work, and um, it was it was interesting because at the same time, um, similar to the work that we were doing in El Museo del Barrio during the retrospective, um, I I was in I well I'm trained to be I'm trained as a caseworker, right, and um, working for the Department of Human Services. So this world it was foreign to me. Um, I was very curious, and I sort of like. Uh, liked it, but I never intended it to happen, right? So these are offers that come to me and people are curious and they wanted to do this stuff. All that I'm saying is that at, at the end of it, I just feel that the work of the, of the people who were in the same show was so different that I began to think of why in the world did they invited me to do this? Mm -hmm. Because my work is just really not about that, right? Mm -hmm. Not about what, what the rest of it. But then at the end, I understand, you know, like I finally understood the, the, um, the curatorial um, mm -hmm. uh, line behind. Well, it, yeah, it's interesting. I, in the interest of disclosure, I was actually an advisor on that and had my own kind of um, dialogue as a part with the curators and with David. Uh, um, no, and, and, and I'm sorry, uh, John, and, and the curator that invited me wasn't even, wasn't even, um, a, 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 it was a John Hanhart in film and okay. video. So that's how I got that. <laughs> and he like, did a special so issue of Art Journal in which I recommended Tiffany to write a piece about right. you. And so you ended up actually being written, this, uh, this work was being written about in the context of video art. Right. Uh, so you take it any way you can. But I, I guess I was going to disagree with you uh -huh. because I understand the ambivalence in terms of the 
a cultural institutional framework for art. But I feel that the work of yours that I've seen has a level of complexity going on that is on a par or uh, uh, supersedes a lot of other work you'll see in the museum. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's uh, for lack of a better phrase, it's competitive within that framework of being something challenging you to engage it in fairly complex ways. But the curators and the critics really do not have uh, the, the skills to bring together the various things that you're referencing. I would have to suggest that maybe when it's also seen in a community context, uh, those viewers don't have all the skills either because you are really bringing together the complexities of the formal operations at work within modern art and the cultural and historical illusions uh, that may uh, reside more firmly within a particular community. Absolutely. And so it's a, it's a fascinating thing because I think, uh, I, in some ways, I think this is a perfect book by Jennifer. Um, we had a great deal of trouble over the forward, which I never share with the artist or the author before it's in print, but some little voice in my head said, share the forward. <laughs> and I did, and they both said, it sucks. <laughs> this, is a, this is horrible, it's, you know. And I was, well, the reason why is I, I thought that uh, Jennifer had so perfectly captured uh, the nature of the, the work and, and the sense that this is work that's moving between two different cultural settings and neither place is it normal or does, is it accepted as something that will be taken uh, seriously in the way that other things are. And I think it's that little bit of loss on each side that is fascinating me about how you move back and forth. And so I'm, I'm wondering, the question I had is, that when, you, when, the, when the woman said, what's the New York Times? Um, and you then went uh, and you did the Bavaria piece. Um, did you change the process by which you made the work, or did you just change the process by which it came to an audience? Does that make sense? No, yeah, no, no, I, uh, no, I did not change the process at all. Okay. It's exactly the same uh, methodology that I used, in, which is engaging people, talking, and creating some sort of a more um, activating spaces and uh, bringing closure um, mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. No, I did not. In fact, I was thinking about that because I think that what I, what, I have, what I had done was to treat the exhibition space um, as an exhibition, as a, as a gallery, you know, as, opposed, uh, as opposed to a place where multiple things could possibly happen. And it was only about work of art being presented and people coming in straightforward to look at it that way. So, um, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And what, what gave me was the opportunity to actually create work in my own terms in many ways and taking the clue from, from somewhere else other than the museum and curatorial mm -hmm. uh, work. It's, it, um, it's, it's also, it, for me, it was also about um, presenting the process. It was, um, you know how you go to the museums and you don't see the artist doing it? <laughs> you just see this thing that comes up and you're related to it. <laughs> but it was, it was really like working in, in, the, in a storefront. People saw me, they saw me crying. I, I, they, they saw me you know, putting people away from fights, breaking <laughs> fights. And they saw me leaving and come back the next day. And you know, it was all very strange. But, it, but they finally got it when the piece went up and they, they saw it. You know, the, big, the beginnings here and there. And um, what it provided was an opportunity for the museum, for the, um, which is very similar to the museum, for the, the um, local residents to partake in the process of it. And by that I mean the storefront had, um, in the, well, many of them, but it changes in places. The storefront had, um, of, of the facade had to be painted only by the guy who is higher in the community. And so there's this negotiation of what goes and the aesthetic and how does that play into it, that it was extremely, extremely delicate. Mm -hmm. And so. I wanted to maybe go forward to um, that section because I'm cognizant of time. And to slip through a few images. Um, this was a painting that was really oh, yeah. important to you, and as your youth was, we could, people can ask about it later, but it's mm -hmm. by Francisco Olet. Mm -hmm. And he's. Um, 
it, it was partly because it was an engagement for you with a, um, a Puerto Rican cultural condition hierarchy and the central figure um, of the man who is the, sort of the beggar uh, with dark skin in the center, but there's all this sort of interracial condition. But also the thing that you told me that really struck you about it was what a large, what a scale sort of project it was and how so much was involved. Everything was there. The people, the animals, all the different class members. It was as if it was sort of a totality, right? And that it right. really moved you and I, inspired you to think about, oh, what art could be. Not only what art could be, but what we can contribute. And, and I think that one of the, I, I, there's a part of me that it's always um, somehow um, will have to come to terms with the fact that um, I wasn't here during the 60s, um, which was primer time for, for Latinos. And I came in in 1975, right? So I lost a lot of understanding of that, and I was in Puerto Rico at that time. But when I, when I came in, I realized that um, um, Latinos were celebrating the Hispanic Month, right? I realized that a lot of exhibitions, and then when I decided to be an artist, I realized that a lot of exhibitions were um, that, ha that had included um, um, Puerto Rican, so Latino artists in general, were giving a very specific space and a very specific um, um, limited space within the exhibition, right? And um, not only, not curated by, by Latinos, but I'm talking about curated by mainstream and, and other people. So it's always like this thing that it was adjacent to, but not really part of, but yes, because we had this obligation to deal with it. And I, and I responded this way. I really, I responded like, I'm gonna work big and I don't care if you don't want it. You know? <laughs> but you're not hiding me. And, and it just this, this really, what I think is courageous now, but at the same time it was like uninformed. I had like no clue <laughs> of what I was doing. But at the same time I was just stubborn. I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I don't want a little corner on the thing. I, you, you're not showing me Big time, <laughs> and that's how that's how I just uh, didn't negotiate that. This is just a th ah. <laughs> this is your first okay. show. This is your first show. Can you go to the next slide, please. My this mother and father used to change furniture every month. <laughs> I'm out, and there you go. Yeah, La Lupe. Right. So these are just images from Pepon's childhood and some some pop culture that was an influence. But let's go ahead on through. Um, I wanted to stop here for a minute because I think this was a really important moment, right? right? Absolutely. So, um, want to say just a couple words about your involvement well, in this? Yeah, this is, um, uh, many of you know Evelina Antonetti, she was a mentor of mine, and um, I worked at the United Bronx Parents Daycare Center for many years, and I met her, and met um, her sister, her daughter, and, and the whole family were very, very close. And um, my aunt, who I came here, well, you know, I got to tell a little story before that, and I know we don't have any time, but I'll tell you. My, my aunt, I, it's, it's um, the reason why I ended up here was because I wanted to come to meet my aunt, who wasn't really my aunt. I just was a made-up aunt. And um, someone who came to visit to Puerto Rico, and when she got to the, to the island, my father said, oh yeah, this is your aunt, maybe like a second or third aunt. And I just said, whoa, New York City, that's where I want to go, so that's my aunt. And um, my aunt was an activist. Ana Enrique was an activist, actually, um, um, who brought me to uh, meet um, Angel, uh, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Evelina Antonetti. And so this, that's how it all started. Right in front of the daycare center where they were filming um, Fort Apache. I don't know if, if many of you, well, I'm sure that all of you know what this is all about. And um, Evelina grabbed me by the hand and said, do you want to know about protesting? La protesta, let's go, let's go, let's do it. And so I was one of those um, people protesting there, and I'm just sitting in the middle of it, and it's all making sense. It's all starting to make sense why she went to the central office and dumped all the lunch bags from the kids in the summer. It all started to make sense about the inequality, and so this for me was an, a, an important uh, moment, it was a really, really important moment where I realized that I can speak back, and then I realize that I can I can dare, and so that's where all this stuff comes uh, from. She was an extremely influential uh, woman, yeah. very powerful woman. 
There's yep. just another image from the mm -hmm. protest. That's a good one. Okay, uh, so also very influential woman, um, Marianne Soto, <laughs> your partner, uh, your wife. My wife, uh, <laughs> for 25 years. And congratulations. <laughs> and a performance artist who you met and uh, worked with on set design and performance in the early years. Um, uh, this is a cocinado, the kitchen where you did a live building of a kind of casita in the middle of the stage, and there were chickens and other things that ended up winning you all a Bessie Award, right? right for right, set right, design. Right. Do you want to say a little bit about maybe just generally? We have a couple more performance images about how performance affected your installation work and how set design sort of affected your installation right. work. This proceeds the rest of the installations, and I think that the theatricalization that you see in my work comes from this experience. I think that in 1985, it must have been 1985, um, I, I was going to several places in Soho, looking at the galleries and looking at the stuff, and I never felt connected to it in many ways, and I was also looking at the five general guides, Julian Schnabel, the white guides who were uh, presenting work and had control of the entire movement in the 80s. And then I felt that I was not somehow there with it. I just felt that the more the work that I sold, the more that I had to talk about some other stuff that didn't relate to me. And not that I had any dreams of being in any gallery at that time, because um, I'll tell you up until this moment, I just, I, that's, it's, it's like a strange world for me. But um, I decided for the next five years, before Susana Torroya Leval invited me to have an exhibition at the Museo del Barrio, for five years not to show work in any exhibition space. And so what happened was that I spent a lot of time presenting work in performances with, with Median, in alternative spaces, and looking at the ex, at, in looking at the performance space as a possibility of that very moment that I have always been interested in. It's that very moment when you walk in and you see something and it really clicks, and you only have you know, a couple of seconds to deal with that. And then afterwards, you know, um, um, it's different. So the performance, um, um, the performative qualities, the theatricalization, that moment, that magic, began to influence my installations. Next slide, please. There you are. Yeah, yeah, we're right here. <laughs> this is, That's yeah. right. I like, can you tell me, because I never knew what it was, um, since I've got you right here, what is the, um, the Puerto Rican traveling kit that she's <laughs> holding in her arms? Ah, this is <laughs> Estela Morales Amaral, who is a graphic designer. Um, this is at the Whitney um, at Philip Morris. And the Puerto Rican traveling kit, it's, um, um, uh, it was, a, it was a, a test where the audience would come in and then had to, um, um, had to define whether they were Puerto Ricans or not. By, <laughs> by this traveling, and it's also, yeah. Okay, great, great. Like migration and right, newness yeah. where, and all of that. Right, where are you? Where are you, you come from? Right. Do you know what, you know, Cafe Bustelo is? <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> okay. And then they share with everybody else, like, no, you're not Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah, that's the similar. Yeah. And I, I perform in some of the, um, in, in some of the collaborations. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I'm sorry the slides are a bit stretched out uh, for us. They should be that's the way the screen is right now. But so the bicicleta was an important piece because it started off as a prop and became a sculpture, and it had yes. these two lives. Mm -hmm. um, part of a kind of move into using mm -hmm. this encrusted object for you, mm -hmm. and also choices of specific objects. And once again, a lot of times the mainstream critics would say. Oh, it's like hyper-decoration and Baroque, which it is. It's those things. But they weren't reading all the little tiny choices that you were making about the palm trees and the men and the way in which the whole bicycle ends up standing for the island and all of the little sort of details in there um, that I really fell in love with when I saw your work. So I said, oh, you know, actually, there's a whole story going on in here. This is a landscape, actually. Mm -hmm. This is not a bicycle, right? This is... This is a landscape. The lost it's, landscape. It's yeah. populated, right? A kind of childhood lost landscape. Can we have the next slide, please? I just also oh, yeah. wanted to say that um, it's it's this is like like Amaros. It's it's quite interesting that also the um, 
the uh, curator, I mean, the, the critics, um, didn't notice that this is one of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, the people who were here at the Museo del Barrio at that time, but it's one of the very first exhibitions that, um, that presented work that had been in the context of theater and now it's seen as, as, as an object, as a work of art. For example, Robert Wilson, um, whose work can be in the theater at the same time, can be in the gallery space. Um, this was happening back then, right? And it, it's quite interesting that, that um, the critics don't look at it in that context. Yeah. They're infatuated with what, what for them is the obvious. So La Cama, another really important piece. Um, would you, are there are there anything things you'd like to say about this piece? No, did you speak? Uh, well, I it's, mean, I can it's, say things about it. But sure, okay. but I, I mean, I just go back again that the women um, are the strongest pillars in the Latino community, and um, this is about another woman and um, who was uh, someone who I adored and died of uh, breast cancer. If you saw the work the slides before with one of the dancers with a magnifying glass around had to do with breast cancer again and it's just one of those things that it's um, um, I had to do a piece about her but also as I said before it was the same year that I got married to Median so I had to introduce Juana this this uh, woman who was influential in my life I had to introduce her in a dream and then this is based on a dream that I had and um, and finally yeah Median is in the front, I'm in the back, and it's all about marriage and life cycles and uh, right. homage. Right. And um, I, the, the, the baseboard of the, of the uh, room, um, um, it's a, it, it has a, a story inscribed. Right, this text um, right up here. Mm -hmm. All the way around the room. At the bottom, yeah. Right. Which is the, talking about the dream, but what Juana said to me, which I was never able to understand until recently, which was at the end, she said, in the dream, actually. And I woke up crying like crazy, and then later on, I, I heard um, someone who is a, um, an academic and someone who's been doing a lot of research that is, what it means is praise for Chung. And as, well, I'm not gonna get into details, but. <laughs> One of the other things that's kind of going on is that in each of the pillars are these stages of life, birth, death, marriage, etc. And there's two figures, a white figure and a dark figure. Um, and on the headboard you have Mariana on one side and you're on the other side. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, just a detail, so, you know, childhood. Right. And one of the things you were doing, too, in terms of kind of a critical race practice was taking these plastic dolls that were always pink and so forth and painting their skin other colors to try to really engage critically with the way this hegemony of whiteness, you know, perpetuates itself, um, and to sort of switch it around a little bit. Can you the next slide? Which makes sense for the Whitney Biennial piece and conforming. That space, right. exactly. And this is you on the back of the right. headboard. So you saw the front of the headboard, this is you on the back of the headboard, surrounded actually by some pretty interesting objects that are all about kind of masculinity and community. So there's men, male dolls as well, whose skin color you also changed, um, and then cigars, and um, little bits of garlic for protection, and then these spots, um, white, uh, black spots on the white ground, which uh, after research I figured out had a little bit to do also with the Yoruba tradition, which has to do with stages of transition. So leopard spots means moving from one stage to another stage. So all of these complex details were, were in the piece to be discovered for those who were going to do the research to find out about it. I think that the, at that time, the discussion of race, the discussion of identity was, um, was uh, one that it was central in, in academia and central in, in, in uh, several places that I um, shared. And what, I'm interest, what I was interested in and still interested in doing is translating that visually in a way that connects to a lot of people without necessarily having to um, um, more to deal with it from a from a um, uh, oh, uh, uh, not intellectual but emotional level, mm -hmm. and so um, I had been I had been um, splitting between uh, the museum, the exhibition spaces, circles of friends, 
who were intellectuals dealing with intellectual and then in the community was actually living with more of the social architecture and the emotional components of it. And so what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to do, and then goes back again to answer the question, is to begin to reverse those um, different spaces by creating work that seems to be not too complicated, yet obvious, yet it's extremely complicated, and having people to understand what they're talking about from a different place. The, um, the bottom of, I think it's a, yes, the bottom of this has a lot of um, um, dark skin dolls and only one light skin, talking about not only how I see the world, but the reverse um, of, of what I've seen around. Can we see the next slide? So here's also this yep. one, uh, the chandelier piece. And um, it's a similar situation where there's this sort of hierarchy. It's like the city, in a way, right? Hierarchy. El país de los tres pisos de... Mm -hmm. yes. And at the top, you have all these light skin dolls, mm -hmm. except the mm -hmm. one dark skin doll with right. the pava. Oh, she just has dark hair, right? With the right, that, with, yes. that, with the hat, the, the, farm, right. the pava hat. So the idea that there's sort of um, in terms of class, you know, there's sort of limited racial access to certain echelons and then and the sort of how the structure of, right. of culture. And, and it also comes from that contradiction that we are perceived as not having, yet I, you, you go, well at that time, I don't know now, but I would go around and I would see all these chandeliers hanging from the, mid, from the projects, you know, like mm -hmm. inside the houses, and I just thought like, really? Like this doesn't connect. <laughs> And That's so great. I really wanted to take that and bring it to um, to light, to, so people can see. Yeah. Let's move forward to um, through a bunch of slides to get to some more recent works. Um, these are a couple more images of scene of the crime, mm -hmm. whose crime, and once again there was a camera in the space, and it was sort of about whose crime is it that Latinos are considered violent? Isn't it the crime maybe of the film industry, right? I mean, whose whose crime is it that we keep seeing um, Latinos? effectively projected this way into our culture. So there was a movie camera, movie lights also in that scene. Can you see the next slide, please? And on here's you see the videotapes we were talking about a little earlier on the left-hand side. Um, the way the, right, the, yeah, the, the linoleum. linoleum comes out, so you know people who don't usually have to stand on cheap linoleum had to stand <laughs> on it, right, to see the piece, it's like, come to my world. All right, next slide, please. Oh, this, the, oh. this is the dining table that was also in this that piece. And so you get, oh, a, you get a sense that there's a presence, there's a family presence, but also they're, they're absent, right? So there was a com capacity to show presence and absence, uh, which I thought was incredibly poetic uh, at the time. And the way the white also uh, references Obatalan. Right. There's a certain way in which each of the spaces um, has a Santeria set of references. All right, next slide, please. Uh, I think we'll pass on this one, but we'll come back to it if we want to. Next slide. Next slide. So here's the front of um, La Barbaria, just so you get a sense of how it was painted. Um, a young man up there crying, holding a mirror while his hair is being cut. Um, over here, the palm tree, uh, creating a kind of, um, yeah. yeah, exactly, Caribbean feel. Um, this little figure down here, <laughs> do you want to say a little bit about that? Little no, no, it just, it, I, it's a reverse. <laughs> right, exactly. So typically, you know, presented as a kind of black slave, it's now painted white, I mean, it's great. Okay, next slide. This is a little more of the interior of La Babaria. You see there's a lot of pictures of men, famous men, as well as um, family members and, and community members. Over pink white wallpaper. Right, so there's a kind of feminizing of the masculine in this space. Can we have the next slide, please? And um, the artist's father, sort of in this, in this pantheon of uh, figures, Castro, uh, <laughs> all kinds of folks up there. Next slide, please a detail of the chair, and on the chair there would be somebody uh, crying, talking, basically crying silently. So it's the, the chair becomes anthropomorphized, and you can see the body. If you look carefully, you can see there's a torso that's been really beautifully silk screened onto the back of the chair, right up here, and then the legs uh, silk screened onto the chair. So suddenly the chair becomes this actual person in the room. It's a really beautiful kind of element to it. Did I you want, want to actually, I wanted to get at something that, that, that I think is present in most of your uh, work, is the, the fact that on one level there is an obvious level of very conscious symbolism. And even in the scene of the crime where the chairs have the photographic images mm. made into them. And yet I think oftentimes the response is to flatten everything down to a two-dimensional sense of the Baroque as merely an overwhelming of unnecessary details. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so it kind of slides into a sense of the kitsch that the value is lessened by the density of the imagery. But as we're going through and describing this in a way an art historian should, you see that all of the elements for a dialogue across symbolism is taking place. And I'm just I'm wondering about your, you're obviously you're doing that, you're making that, but it, I'm just wondering about the problematic of a certain type of work in order um, to do what it needs to do, in order to bring different cultural frameworks into contact. Uh, you're kind of dancing between doing what other artists are doing but being taken seriously, which is mobilizing form and uh, forms of representation to get ideas moving. And the sense of the Baroque as something that's not a major cultural system defining a half a millennium, but a way of dismissing too much information. It's the kind of TMI of Anglo culture. <laughs> And I'm just, I, I, I don't know if that's a question or an observation, but it, it's, it strikes me as the, the knife you dance on, or the edge you dance on, in terms of uh, doing it nonetheless. And putting well, it, it's, I, I, <laughs> I don't think we're going to talk about this. <laughs> I, live, I, I think that I live a life, and I have always lived a life, let me put it this way, between perception and reality. You know, that's just the bottom line. And, and I think that um, I, and it comes very clearly in, in the work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that what you are referring to in terms, it's, it's an imposition. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how do you work within this imposition that I have felt yeah. for all my life? And that mm -hmm. it's, that it's in, in, in ingrained in my, in my DNA somehow. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite interesting because at the same time, as much as I wanted it to be um, a, uh, an installation about liberation, reaffirmation, it really, it's, it's dealing with, at the times, so with a heavy weight. Um, and how do, you, how do you break away from that? And the heavy weight, it's just, you know, what has been established, yeah. the flatness, the, the, yeah. the, what you're talking about, this. Um, well, uh, but at the same time, there's uh, this subversiveness to yeah. it, and I think that that's that's the way that I that I go about. Well, it seems like there are two things going on, and I've seen very prominent and well-respected critics really um, go into to both, and I think it it has a particular impact among racialized minority groups in the U.S. A particular impact for Latinos because of language, and there's often a sense that I don't know the codes. I don't know the linguistic codes. Uh, if you're using Spanish words, I'm, I'm not, I don't understand it. But I also don't know the systems of meaning that stand behind them, not just as a liberal translation of, oh, that's the word for frog. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I'm not going to talk about it because I will get it wrong. And these same critics have no problem getting it wrong about other work in which they do know the codes. That's what interpretation is. You're getting it wrong. And that starts a dialogue. But the other has to do with place, and I've seen this very prominently in terms of artists who do work in communities that are disenfranchised and impoverished, that there is a criticism that this is not the appropriate place for work because I will not feel safe, and therefore I cannot stand there and contemplate my relationship as an eyeball to the art object if I'm worrying about what's happening to my car two blocks away. <laughs> and literally, that has been written into our journal. Right? Um, again, I'm not sure what the question is, but um, I, I noticed this when we, we did the book on Rafael Ferrer, and about as high a modernist as you can get, uh, showing in the Whitney when he's putting uh, ice and straw together. When he begins to put Spanish words into his work, he kind of disappears off the radar because how do I understand that that's wordplay? You're telling me that's wordplay. I don't know the language. And then 30 years later, suddenly uh, Spanish is the number one language for television and radio in New York and LA. Right. Suddenly he's relevant. Right? So the, culture frame, the cultural frames have changed. And I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of your sense of, of that, not, not as how do we make the critics like us, 
But that reality expressed by critics is true of the larger institutions in our society. And we have that as a debate over things even when they're written into law about providing translation for people in court when they're voting, uh, and things like that, that really facilitate, um, not equality, I don't think there is such a thing, but participation. That's the reason why the book makes so much sense. I know. I well, just, just, just <laughs> <said it all. laughs> wrote it, but I, but I, but it's. Um, I, I'm, I'm also um, aware that being a Latino, it's artist and a Latina artist. It's a place of vulnerability. And it's, it's really, it's a place where you feel extremely vulnerable. And, um, and I'm, I'm always been very cautious of that. Um, it's a place in, in my work where you open up stories, where you open up a community that allowed other people to see it and make it really fragile and allowed other people just to come in outside of that place. And so, um, I don't know if I'm answering the question or, or, or commenting on what you're saying, but what you were, what, when you were talking, I was just thinking about the vulnerability that I always mm -hmm. feel um, as a Latino artist in mainstream. Um, yeah. with, with, and again, with the perception that people have that, that I'm extremely powerful, I'm just extremely vulnerable in those places. Because well, I know what it means, yeah. and, I stand, and I know where I stand. Well, it's true for the Latino curators as well. We try to push that edge. Um, and I, and I, you mentioned that with respect to this piece um, in a community setting, mm -hmm. that the vulnerability goes both ways. It's not just with the dominant institutions and the, the status system right, that attached to them. If you're really, and I think you're in the best tradition of this, really working within a community as a way of being the artist, of putting forth a statement, that can exist within a very distinct uh, cultural context in which there are hierarchies, there are uh, procedures and whatnot, that you're gonna be very vulnerable there as well. And as you mentioned, I mean, it, it sounds trivial, but the sense, well, you have to have so-and-so paint that. But that also becomes the moment where you have to give up some degree of control in order to actually have authorial control. And so it's a kind of dance between you and that setting. Well, it's vulnerable, but it's also strategic, I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, for example, the recent piece you did in Williams, um, at Williams Williams College, College. yeah, um, which had to do with the sort of class difference between Williams and um, North Adams and the way those two communities live side by side and yet are so economically different from each other. And I interviewed some of the people that work with Pippon because I tried to go around and interview people who had then been affected by his pieces or had worked with him and was able to find some. And um, it was really moving to me to hear the curator at Williams talk about the fact that your pieces, your working method was about putting people in their own vulnerable spaces. So you have this sort of wonderful strategic warmth where you invite everyone in and say, let's have a conversation. Oh, and isn't it interesting? And what's your, you know, how do you feel about the space? And how do you feel about the space? And how do you, and the, the, the conditions of dialogue bring out tensions that are real tensions in the community. Uh, and then the piece ends up being a site, as it were, to work those. The conversation in the community is one of a, uh, affirmation, mm -hmm. and it's one of um, relating to it. I, they, as I said, the process is extremely complex because I look and I buy within a one mile radius of that of that of that uh, place, and I hired, in terms of the uh, employment, I hire the people to work with me who work in that community. So it's a little bit more complex than that. At the end, the discussion about the place of contemporary art within the context of tradition is the one that always stands out. Mm -hmm. Like, where does this work fit in the tradition, in my tradition? Mm -hmm. People are interested in very much um, um, engaged with the, with the objects. Um, in the museum uh, becomes, or the gallery space, um, exhibition space, let me put it that way, becomes, um, a little bit more of a clinical um, situation where the work is actually seen and um, 
the work it's seen, but there is a certain degree of separation from it where you have to behave in a certain way, where people need to um, react to it in a certain way, and somehow it's framed within some sort of like a middle class mentality that often offer that opportunity of where I am and how I am in relationship to the work. Now, in the scene of the crime, because this is a really pivotal shift in your work, but also I think an installation and the debates taking place about artists going out into a community uh, and then ultimately situating the work in a gallery space. In Scene of the Crime, you kind of play with that in terms of the police tape blocking out a place you can't go into anyway because of uh, museum protocols. Mm -hmm. That's right. In yeah. fact, actually, I wanted to come back to this image because you wrote about this one in the book, out in this kind of material space. Can you say something about people who inspired you to that method or my curiosity for the social architecture of spaces you know and and and, and places um, informed that as well um, the experience of Evelyn Antonetti the experience of Anne Enrique the experience of all these women who were extremely instrumental in my work and I just thought you know like that matters <laughs> right and so holding that up. Yeah. Well, one of the early pieces where you oh, did yeah. that was uh, Badge of Honor, right. which was a really moving piece, and the Smithsonian collected it. And uh, it's a piece about no, 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 no. They did um, they they did the, the kaleidoscope exhibition. That's right, the kaleidoscope exhibition, and um, they it's about a son uh, whose father is in prison right. and their their relation, mm -hmm. and you went to the father and the son, and you said, um, can I videotape you? And you worked with a video artist. Um, Irene Sosa. Yeah, Sosa, and Irene Sosa, and she and you strategically found a way to have the father ask his son questions, because he was in this maximum security prison, and he couldn't talk to his son directly, mm -hmm. and then take the tape to the son, and then have the son see it and ask his father house. questions right. at the house. And then, um, can we see the next slide, please? Um, then in the installation, next slide please, you put the prison room next to the son's bedroom. Next slide please. Um, and you get a sense here then the father is speaking in his cell to his son. And next slide please. And here you get a sense of the whole installation. And uh, time? Oh, okay. Just want to open it to the phone. Absolutely. Um, do you want to, so anyway, I just wanted to give a sense of this really important piece for Pepon and what it meant to do that kind of project, and the, when we talked to the family afterwards, how much they had been affected by the piece and their own participation in the piece. So that's just another example of you changing right. the lives of specific people through this process. Right, and, and, and vul vulnerability at many, many, many different levels at the same time. Um, I, I have to show the video, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, okay. <that's> <laughs> So what happened was that I went back and forth, and, and, and it's part of the, the methodology, I um, didn't say anything. Just went, went to the um, uh, person and told the, um, the uh, person, the subject, I told him one word. And the first word that I used that very first day was abuelo. That's all I said, abuelo. And then I had the camera on my shoulder, the uh, videographer was next to me, Lenny Sosa, I had the camera on my shoulder or somewhere around here, and we just captured the guy. And took that information, and um, that footage, and went to um, the son at his house, and played it on the TV, and captured the response. What I really wanted to do was to construct this, this conversation that seemed um, virtual, but it's very based on reality. and. Um, as in the rest of the pieces, I have to say that my work, it's, it's, it's real, it's, it's, there's no fiction whatsoever, um, but the installations are an interpretation of what I see. And um, real people, real life, and real stories. And I just wanted to show you just like one minute, because this is like quite a um, moving piece, and you will, you, will say, you will understand why my life is so complicated. <laughs> that, that I will forgive you. Oh. He forgave me his dream. Well, David, because people can imagine really that this is him talking about. <laughs> the question you asked me before, did, do I think my father forgave me? Yes, he did forgive me. He did forgive me because in the dream he forgave me. So I, I would say yes, he forgave me. And I just, it was, it was so beautiful, you know, to see your father after 
so many years not seeing him. I felt good. I was happy. I woke up happy that that day. I was just like I called I called mommy up, and I called I told her mama, you know, Hana had a dream with my father, and and it was something because I, I got to see him. I got to see him. You know, just seeing him again it was like wow. You know. Well, that there is one dream that I had about you, that like I was a cop and there was like I was going in with my squad for a drug bust. And you was like the dealer or whatever. And like once we got upstairs, like we caught everybody and like you ran and I went after you and then like we I like once I saw you or whatever, like I just stopped and like you, you we both had our guns out and you just dropped your gun and I dropped my gun and then I don't know what happened and we just hugged and then I woke up. I hear you, Nelson, about your dream, and I think it was a real nice dream. And I want you to know that in this life, Nelson, if, in order to live a good and straight life, you have to forgive, and you have to forgive, Nelson. Thank you. So. And so, um, <clears throat> in a way, that's what I mean about, about the vulnerability, and also, um, finding my place in relationship to them, which informed, the process always informs the, uh, the installations, which then it made perfect sense for the viewer to be in that triangular relationship with these two people, as you're standing in front of the piece, and um, you go back and forth into these two realities that um, somehow are part of a reality that I live. Myself. We're going to go to questions now. All yes. right. Thanks, Pepon. <laughs> Thank you. John, I, I don't want to finish without you talking about the rest of the artists who are also part of the oh. um, of it. Well, let's so, take questions first. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that. Can uh, I ask the public a very distinguished group of uh, scholars, artists, and so forth to let you finish the stuff when they address the family, so you can know who they are and, yes, be great. and tell the audience at home. Who they are. Thank you. Uh, one behind the menu next. Congratulations. Uh, beautiful panel. Pepon and I were part of a, the Centro Advisory Committee back in the day, but I, I was able to see the Whitney exhibit and, and the uh, father and son. Um, maybe you want to share a couple of other stories. One you mentioned to me once where you were, I think it was Beverly Hills, <laughs> and you, uh, you, you were in a house and you were able to line up their whole kitchen. Ah, um, um, like, like no, 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 Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Yeah, I think that was, that was a, a beautiful little twist to change spaces over there. But uh, could, I know one thing I'm, I'm especially proud of is that you're a MacArthur Fellow. How has that changed your life? <laughs> um, I, uh, it has, it, no, it, it has brought me to, to, to meet and to get to know a lot of people um, who are outstanding at what they do. And, 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 and that conversation it has always been um, quite important for me. I, I, I maintain relationship with, with few of them, and one of them is Amalia Mesa Baines, a, a Chicana artist, by the way. And, uh, the level of conversation and understanding of the work that she does and the purpose, but it's actually, um, I also have moved me to a place of, of looking at, the, at, 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 at looking at whatever the situation is in a much grander place, in a much bigger place. Um, I had always been concentrating very specifically with a um, few things, and now it's just like um, much bigger than that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, and to be recognized as, um, I don't know, yeah, to be able to be recognized. It, but I tell you, in a funny way, it has made my process of making art much easier. And not because of the money, because I don't get any money to do this work. But when I go to places, for example, I can go to any detectives and say, I'm a MacArthur. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll get you two detectives now. <laughs> as opposed to, like, who are you? <laughs> they didn't so give you a card? Yeah. A little MacArthur card? <laughs> 
But if you, if you like, for example, I work with the Department of Human Services in Philadelphia, that took me one conversation. And it was really wonderful. And of course, the, the commissioner was a Latina, so she understood where I was coming from. But had I been like somewhere else, or, and it would just access in, in, in ways that has um, helped my, my production in, in many ways. And I think that I'm, yeah, that. I'm glad to uh, hear that you're very proud of your African heritage. Um, how do you deal with white Latino privilege in the art world? By ignoring it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also by understanding the complexity in, in, in which they live and the preferences um, in which they lived. Um, and by also reminding them, because I know many of them, that it's relative, and at the same time, it's a short privilege. At the end of the day, we know where we stand. <laughs> yeah, I just to me, um, it's, all, it's all relative, it's just, when you said it, it sounded absolute, and now I'm listening to it, and I'm going like, yeah, but that's, that privilege lasts until you can sustain yourself up there, and then that's it. So I got two impressions that I was very curious to see if you at all included these factors purposely in your work. One is the notion of shadow. Yeah. Because I feel in your uh, installations that there's a sense of shadow behind the obvious and behind the density of it all. But, and it was obvious when you did it on the chair with the uh, barbershop, but during that picture, your shadow from the light here was on the screen. So it sort of brought that out for me. Wait a minute, his shadow is everywhere here. So I was wondering if <laughs> that notion of something behind and not obvious is part of the work. And the second question is, as, uh, as you were speaking earlier about the white and the mainstream critics, I was wondering if the experience that you create at all had something to do with that in this sense that it feels to me like your installation is almost, it has a quality to it of of overpowering you, of taking you in. I, I used to be a scuba diver, and I've been down in the water 100 feet, and I have felt down there the way I felt when I looked in your installation, like you have to swim in this installation that is so dense, and you don't know what's in every corner. So I felt like I was diving underwater, and I wonder how many of these guys, uh, they're all guys probably, how they feel when they step on that melody into that space. <laughs> I, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about the codification of my work, but I'll tell you the depth is extremely present in the work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 it's there all the time. Um, and sometimes I associate that with shadows and um, uh, that. I'll leave it there. Um, surfacing, to going under. It's an interesting metaphor, but I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid of emptiness. I'm, I'm, I'm very much, so it's, it, obviously, you know, <laughs> fear of the emptiness. <laughs> um, because I come from a family that my father used to buy two of everything. Um, he was in World War II, so um, he always, we went to the supermarket always as if the war was the next day. Oh my God. And, um, and so there's that sense of, 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 of not having. And also, both of them came from uh, Depression era in Puerto Rico, which was pretty heavy. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking, but I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I can't. I can't. Yeah. Arlene? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Arlene Davila. 
Um, I guess my question had to do with the project also, because I noticed that the Bond's book will be the first on the New York artist, and there's a couple on Juan Sanchez and a couple others. But the artists that have been kind of memorialized in this incredible series, which tends to sort of challenge the dominant art history by documenting our artists, mm -hmm. which is so important. But it's that they all tend to be the same kind of generation. And it's, well, similar generation, but but artists that came about at a moment that is very different than today. Mm -hmm. um, at least there was more recognition of identity-based work, community-based work, uh, perhaps more um, infrastructural um, support from institutions, correct? And uh, my question concerns uh, new generations, because I remember being at the same forum when the Centro launched the New York Art uh, Portfolio. And in the, at that event, there were new generations of artists that got up and asked, uh, complaining that they felt they had no support in the community and wondering what was going to happen. Here we have a goal. I don't know if many of you were here. I think Gabriel was here. I, um, I don't know, but I want to interrupt you. I want to introduce Miguel Luciano, okay. <laughs> who not only I esteem very much, but also it's one of the artists from a new generation of um, uh, who I consider. I'm sorry. Awesome. <laughs> So that's why I go, if you could, if you could, besides Miguel, who of course is a part of that new generation, if you imagine um, kind of um, what is your vision for new artists, um, New Yorkian artists, um, so that imagine 20 years from now we have new Aver volumes, right? Do you imagine that we will then have three or four or five new artists that we will be memorializing because they want to be as big as you? And, and also what, what some recommendations basically, so that we can continue not only uh, the legacy of the artists that we do have now, but imagine 20 years from now. I can start with the, with the book series, because uh, we started this actually about 10 years ago, in terms of getting, getting it going, put, pulling together the advisory board. And but doing research, because the, it's not like the foundations were waiting to support this. Um, and what we did is looked at artists born before 1970 uh, that we could in some ways find in the world. In other words, it had exhibitions that were markers for them and that that would be one indicator of, of success. Not the only one, uh, but we knew we could say these are people who have been able to make a career as an artist. And we ran their names through the union list of artist names uh, that's owned by the Getty. We ran it through search engines for art history. And we graphically mapped it out. There were only three artists that really showed up in any of these. And that was Felix uh, um, Torres, 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 Torres um, Judy Baca, and Molly Mesa Baines. And so I decided to actually map it out as a PDF and it went over about 18 pages, and what you saw were the search engines, the artist names, page after page, and then whenever they'd had an article, we'd put a little X. And I heard back from one of the foundations where we'd sent this, because we figured, well, we're sending, um, we're sending the evidence. And they said, you know, it was like, uh, we weren't really thrilled by the project, we didn't think there was merit, but then when we looked at that, by about the fifth page, we got sick to our stomach. Because I visualized it, that this is the nature of exclusion for people who actually have a career as an artist. Um, and then the, you know, the other side was my own experience. Uh, back when there used to be bookstores, I loved going to them, sitting on the ground by the arts and going through the monographs of artists. It didn't matter what artists, I just liked looking at it and all of that. And then I thought, well, I know some pretty well-known artists. I know, you know, Pepon, Malia, uh, Rafael Ortiz, uh, I couldn't find any books on them. And so that, that was kind of the idea. I and mean, then we did decide to, to uh, in, in the discussions, we over the three or four days, you know, we're kind of going, looking at a lot of artists. We decided to kind of tilt towards the older artists. Except for Bob. He's the baby. Uh, and Grom, could you believe when he says he was born? But <laughs> um, But more or less, we, we, the older living artists, uh, we had hoped to do something, a book on Lorenzo Omar. Uh, the one person who could have written it uh, was not able to commit within the time frame. At the time, he was almost 100 years old. Um, and so what we did was um, review the whole list and I realized it's like any committee, it was starting to get political. 
And people were saying, oh my God, you know, how am I gonna get votes for my person? And so I, I proposed the desert island methodology. I said, you're gonna be dropped on desert island, you can take one artist with you, write down your names. Everybody did. We put it up there and it so disturbed everybody, they immediately wanted to vote again. <laughs> because what happened is, the people that were really there to represent, say, Chicano artists, were kind of blown away by a Puerto Rican artist and put it, is her name now? And then, you know, this vice versa. And we realized that we ended up with a really odd list of people that we would not have come to consciously, but it made sense. And it made sense for two reasons. Uh, it made sense because they were really good artists, but it also made sense because we were selecting from a larger pool of about 90 established artists. Each and every one of them deserved a book. And so we kind of worked with that. There's no way we were going to get it right. And then we entered into contingency and serendipity, which is um, I had a plan that we produce these books like sausages in a factory. And the first thing that happened is everybody started getting married, having children, you know, <laughs> the writers. <laughs> you were one of many. <laughs> um, and so the books kind of came out as they came out. Um, like babies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, if only. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. And we had a really wide range of, um, of authors. Nobody, we had very few people that were actually trained as art historians. We had a few, uh, mostly the Cubans, <laughs> Cuban, Cuban uh, 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 writers. Um, but that was kind of nice because we realized that the field was not necessarily going to take these books in and say, oh, we've been waiting for them, now we're going to put them in classes. They were more likely to be taught in women's studies courses, ethnic studies courses, American culture, um, American studies courses, Latin American studies courses, but not in art history. Um, but that said, we set up a framework in which we were going to meet or exceed the rigors of that discipline regardless. That when the field does come around, uh, this work is going to hold its own. And that's kind of the, 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 the process you you know, in terms of how we ended up with this. Um, okay. And then the other thing, I just one last thing I did, because I really see this as a long-term issue. This series may be, you know, short to moderate term uh, in terms of its own existence. But what became aware to us is that while we had made our commitments, there were a number of artists in their 80s and 90s who we had not selected, but we went and did oral histories with them. Um, because we felt it was absolutely, it, it, and this, this was after Carlos Cortez and Lorenzo Amato passed away fairly proximate to each other, that we needed to do what we could outside the, the scope of a specific project making books. We had to gather um, the artist's sense of their life in their own voice. We had to see what we could to um, make sure the work was ar archived or accessible for future research. Yeah. Well, I wanted to come back to the question which just had to do about sort of what about the next generation mm -hmm. and youth. Oh, yeah. and, um, I was thinking about the fact that uh, it's really important to get people into the academy too. You know, we need writers and scholars and historians who care about the work and who want to write about it, but we also need to train people who are critics. In other words, you know, it's, it's been too long that critics have um, all been very ethnically homogeneous, um, class homogeneous, that there needs to be a way that a new voice of writing about art gets out there and we need, um, I mean, I would be delighted to work with younger people who want to learn how to write critically um, and intelligently about visual art and who, but who know that their goal is not just to write about the white mainstream again and again and again. Because really what happens is it's about who goes to the galleries, who gets in there and sees the work and how that work gets seen by others. So the youth, I mean, or the young, there's youth and there's just simply the younger generation who are actually fairly well established in terms of their practice. You know, they need people to write about the work. And so mm -hmm. people will call me and say, Jennifer, you know, will you write about my show or can you write about this? And I say, I can, I can't, whatever my schedule is like right now. But I realize there's just, a, there's a missing population of, of critics and writers who will actually produce the essays that will go into the magazines and the, and the mainstream, um, as well as our own publications.
right? And I think that's really that's really what we need also to think about, not just the makers, but the infrastructure to support that. It's so critical, and it's really, I actually with some of these, uh, we've gone through two or three people. It's not like, just because we commission if the person actually delivers a, a book. Um, and I am always gathering names of people and meeting with them um, as future writers. And at some point, we're going to shift this from being a curated series to being an open call. And in fact, um, the other book that came out at the same time as the one on Bifon, uh, Ricardo Valverde, was our first over the transom book of somebody who did it outside of the support structure we had at a certain point for the, for the series. The curators and the scholars what the limitation there is our history departments, because both curators and professors have to get their PhD through our history, by and large, to work within the field. Most of the folks have done this, haven't done their PhD in art history, per se. Um, well, I'm currently working on a project that has been funded by the Mellon Foundation to create a pipeline for curators of color. And it's launching this summer, and it's at five comprehensive art museums. Um, the Art Institute in Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the LA County Museum of Art, the High Museum in Atlanta, and the Nielsen Atkins in Kansas City. And the idea is to connect students in college in those cities to the comprehensive art museum and as an undergraduate, and get them to understand the curator role as a, 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 as a uh, career option and to understand the museum in a way that it's pretty almost impossible for a summer intern where you're just doing somebody's paperwork for 10 weeks. And that launches this summer. It's been phenomenal looking at the applications for students, whether they're coming from community colleges or uh, elite research institutions. And the thing that shocked me is something that I didn't think existed, which was that even as sophomores, you have so many uh, black, Latino, Asian um, undergraduates interested in our history. They are there. We thought we'd be getting applications from people that had not even declared a major yet. So no, I want to do art history. Um, and they're really phenomenal. And they have broad visions, and they're interested in whatever they're interested in, which is, is really uh, uh, phenomenal. Something happens by the time they get to senior year that they are not entering into graduate programs. Um, and I think that a program like this is providing mentorship and credentialing, as it were, that may help break that impasse. I mean, I can speculate about it, but I didn't even know that that existed. That, you know, in LA, we got almost 100 applications from kids in that region that were all just passionate about art and art history. And you don't see that by the time you get to the graduate level. They're not there. They just disappear if they don't get into that arena. And then I know of some who do, and it's, 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 a, it's a tough... It's, it's, a, a, it's a hostile arena. It's a very hostile right. arena. So art history has been a Eurocentric discipline, and it's maintained its Eurocentrism um, much longer than the other disciplines in the humanities, yeah. and, uh, and only is slowly changing now. It's very behind, I would mm -hmm. argue. And it's very frustrating, both as a professor, um, to see you know who's applying and trying to support those students who are applying mm -hmm. to come into that, um, but then to mentor them within it, yeah. right? And to sort of and to uh, hear you know the difficulties that they face. Yeah. You know, well, you know, I'm applying to CAA, but there's not a single panel on Latino art at CAA this year. Yeah. And I'm like, how can that be, right? You know, so this kind of perpetuation. I see people nodding. And, and <laughs> this kind of perpetuation to... of the of the hierarchy of what constitutes culture, right? What constitutes good, you know, reasonable object of study is still fraught. I mean, there's battles to be fought there. So I'm just yeah. saying, any of you out there who can mentor those students, send well, them to me. And it's so important to realize <laughs> that, that those departments are the factory that make curators. Yeah. And, um, and, and museum directors. And, yeah. and, and, the, and in a comprehensive art museum, we are likely to see some degree of diversity at the curatorial level. The education department is going to be mostly brown. <laughs> because they're dealing with the actual students in their cities. Uh, it's going to be the contemporary art department. And many of those curators won't have PhDs. They're coming out of the gallery system. And that's even more accessible 
in some ways than art history. It is, but also more vulnerable. Yeah. Than they can. Like, they they don't have the same status with them. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, I'm, because you're a teacher cool. too now, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Do you want to say anything um, about sort of the pipeline and artists and sort of how I, you see them? A glass it just goes back again to the same issue of vulnerability because I, I, um, I what I have noticed is that there is there's been um, a tremendous wave of of cross generational artists across um, um, all of our Latino communities that um, that have done extensive work, and then I look at social practice, and then I look at um, um, place making, and I'm looking at all these things with a group of people that are not necessarily representative of where the origins of that come in, and it's just so complex. It's just such a um, convoluted reality that I that I that it's hard to um, figure out. So I see it all the time, um, and I'm also um, Working very hard in changing the model in which the um, master's programs are 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 um, created. It's all it's it's extremely Eurocentric. I agree, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's 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 all about um, it's all about the object. It's all about the production of art. And so mm -hmm. I think that what this um, new generation brings is is the possibility of thinking that it's not only about art, mm -hmm. and nobody wants to deal with that. So mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the problems. I'd just like to thank you for uh, taking the time to come here and share your thoughts with us. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure this will not be the last time we bring you to uh, <laughs> to discuss another artist. And, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of people here who would like to talk to you individually. There are, as I understand, there's a few copies of the book out there. Uh, meet the Authors is what this is called, so you can meet them. Get them to sign your book, for that you have to purchase it. And, and help Sean continue this uh, mission, okay? So thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you.